years ago this month, the pilot episode for Wrestling Society X was filmed. What would follow would be one single memorable season of Wrestling Mayhem, which, no matter your opinion of it, left an indelible mark on fans the world over. You know I've spoken at length about this show in the past, but this week, to celebrate this big anniversary, I have a special guest here who's going to give you his side of the story. Ladies and gentlemen, the creator of Wrestling Society X and the current president of Mass Republic, Mr. Kevin Kleinrock. Kevin, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Brian. It is awesome to be here. I, I am a big fan of your videos, and I'm glad to finally be part of one. Absolutely. Now, first, let's talk about your history with wrestling before Wrestling Society X. Now, you were an executive in XPW, correct? What exactly was your position there? My official role in XPW was vice president of operations. I was part of a group of four guys uh, at the time, uh, actually, it was me and, and two others, who started XPW from the beginning with, um, with Rob Black. And so, literally, I did everything. Um, wrote the shows, produced the shows, um, uh, did, I mean, ran the business side of things. W I mean, without XPW, there would have never been a Wrestling Society X. Um, it was it was what we had built there and what we did there and a lot of the relationships that we developed that led to us even being able to um, create and pitch Wrestling Society X. So, Kevin, the question a lot of my fans want to know is just how did this show come into being? I, so I've been involved in professional wrestling since I was 16 years old, starting to work for the smallest local wrestling company that there was here in, uh, in the Los Angeles area, a company called Slammers Wrestling Gym, Slammers Wrestling Federation. And throughout time, through all of the wrestling stuff I had done, my two big kind of passions in life were pro wrestling and music. And back when we were doing XPW, one of the shows that we were doing at the Olympic Auditorium, uh, the band Rancid, who was my favorite band, uh, happened to show up and be there for Vampiro one night. And it was incredible. I always describe it as kind of like that commercial with Santa Claus and the M&Ms where like they show up and they see each other and they notice that each other's real. And it was like, they showed up and they're like, yeah, we watched the XPW videos. And my mind was completely blown because uh, I was a huge, huge fan of theirs and, and still are to this day. And, after that, I kept hearing more and more about punk rock bands that really like pro wrestling. And it was kind of in the back of my mind, it'd be really cool if one day we had the ability to bring all these punk rock bands that love wrestling together with pro wrestling and do something. And I was working for a company called Big Vision Entertainment. And we were, wasn't, I wasn't doing anything promoting pro wrestling, but we were distributing a ton of pro wrestling content on home video. And Big Vision actually was a company that um, came from a company called XCG. They had started the whole backyard wrestling craze, and then they started distributing uh, XPW home videos and, and other companies. And uh, the, the boss, uh, Houston Curtis, who was a former MTV executive, was going into MTV one day to, he was going to be pitching a, a frat house poker show. This was back when poker was super hot. And he wanted to do like this college poker show. And I just kind of casually mentioned to him, I said, hey, you know, uh, if ever the opportunity comes up, I have this idea for something that would be pro wrestling and, and music and, you know, it'd be great to pitch it to MTV. Originally, it was actually going to be the Rancid Wrestling Federation. That's kind of how we... Um, came up with the, the idea of what it was going to be. But after talking with the band um, and completely respectfully, they, they had said, look, you know, for all these years, I think it'd probably been about 15 years at the time, they had never allowed anybody else to control anything that had their name on it. And they didn't want to start now. And they felt really uncomfortable putting their name on something MTV would control. And as I learned through this whole process, they were, absolutely right because mtv um you know had their fingerprints not like not to finger like handprints all over the show um and so after after some discussions internally um wrestling society x was born out of that but uh we pitched it and thankfully probably in part because houston was a former mtv executive and in part because they were looking for programming that would attract guys to the network because they had lost basically any programming that had guys watching mtv they uh, were interested in shooting a pilot for the show. But this was something that was completely developed with MTV. And that's also why Wrestling Society X doesn't exist today. Because even after the show went off the air, if we ever did anything 
with the brand and the name Wrestling Society X, MTV would still own 50% of it. So what was your vision for Wrestling Society X when it all began? Part of, part of my quest with the show was I felt like what the outsiders who either used to be pro wrestling fans or had never been pro wrestling fans thought of when they thought of pro wrestling was kind of the 80s version of pro wrestling was big jacked up dudes in trunks doing leg drops and body slams and i wanted to show the world that wrestling had kind of evolved past that that it was a lot more athletic these days that there was a lot more excitement to it and that was kind of the the mission with wrestling society x and i think you know to that end the show presented that now you can't talk about wrestling society x without talking about all the special effects and the pyro and the explosions that was the linchpin that was one of the trademarks of wsx so tell me was it your intention to have all the special effects be so overboard and so over the top we definitely knew that there was going to be some stunts that we wanted to do some big things at some points um i mean if you remember or if people know back in xpw every now and then we did an exploding ring match or uh different things that we had done over time with pyro mtv was like if we're going to do pro wrestling we need to do pro wrestling that you cannot see anywhere else there has to be crazy stuff every single week sitting around a development meeting one day and I really was just casually talking, and I mentioned that there were crazy matches in Japan, like exploding cage matches and piranha death matches, and, and they latched onto that. And it was like, we need to do that. Let's do that on the first episode. And, and I was like, wait, wait, we, we can't start there. <laughs> like, if you want to do that, we need to build to that. And that's why on the very last episode that never aired on television, but it's on the, the DVD set, we had an exploding cage match and a piranha death match because that's what they fixated on once they heard that these things existed. Um, but they really wanted to do a big explosion stunt every single week. And the compromise that we kind of came up with was we did it every other week. Like if you go back and you look at the explosion, it literally was every other week there was a big explosion. That's because that's what I had to give in on. Um, uh, you know, I got away with not doing it every week, but it had to be every other week. So how else did MTV influence the product? What the show looked like live and what the matches looked like live was very different than what fans actually ended up seeing on television. The two mandates for the whole series were don't do anything that kids can easily replicate at home because you know, ever since the whole Beavis and Butthead and fire and, and MTV is very gun shy about kids being able to replicate things at home. So we weren't allowed to use a steel chair. We weren't allowed to use a kendo stick, but we were allowed to slam people on the thumbtacks and then have things explode because kids couldn't find thumbtacks. I don't, I don't know. Um, and obviously the explosions were the explosions, um, but it went beyond that. And when we got into the editing, MTV wanted punching cut out, kicking cut out, anything that resembled a rest hold cut out. So literally the finished product on TV was like high spot, high spot, high spot. And to a regular wrestling fan, it was jarring because it's like, where did the storytelling go? Where did the bulk of the match go? And so, you know, while people have commented and, you know, even watching your video, I completely agree with how butchered the the uh, the editing was. Now, 30 minutes was a very short amount of time to have a wrestling show, but that's what you dealt with with Wrestling Society X. If the show had gone a full hour instead of 30 minutes, how would the show have been different? I mean, obviously matches would have been a little longer, but what else would have been different? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would have loved to do an hour on MTV. I think that would have been awesome. Um, I think an hour for a wrestling product like this is kind of the ideal time. I mean, like we knew from the beginning, a half hour was not an ideal time. But if you looked at MTV programming, everything was a half hour. And their whole desire to build a guy's night on MTV was to have a two hour block of four half hour shows. And, and that's what we were being put in there for. But the length of the matches, but then also, you know, we had to build this roster of talent and we could only feature so much talent each week in a half hour. Uh, and it was like 22 minutes of programming actually. Plus there was the musical guest. And, and so, you know, we're really talking about like 20, 21 minutes of content. Um, so we probably would have been able to see more guys featured 
um, throughout each episode rather than only having about six people featured on each episode. So those would have been really the, the two main differences, I think. You know, it seems like I get at least two or three comments a week on my original Wrestling Society X review along the lines of, is that Seth Rollins? Is that Seth Rollins? Is that Seth Rollins? And the answer, folks, is yes. That is very much Seth Rollins, back when he was known as Tyler Black. Now, obviously, uh, Seth Rollins has gone on to have a great career. He did really well for himself in Ring of Honor. And, of course, we all know his story in WWE. So, Kevin, my question is, when you saw Tyler Black in Wrestling Society X, did you ever foresee that he was going to have the amazing career that he's had? So that's a great question about Tyler Black. Um, the very first time I saw Tyler Black, my exact comment was, one day this guy is going to be WWE Intercontinental Champion. I, I knew they were going to take him. I knew they were going to love him, but I didn't foresee him becoming as big a superstar uh, as, he, as he's become. Uh, it's been awesome to see. What would you say would be your favorite match or moment in Wrestling Society X? I think the matches with Dragon Gate, the drag guys from Dragon Gate, um, Yoshino and Horiguchi against Teddy Hart and uh, M Dog Matt Cross, those were great. Uh, and anytime Dragon, the Dragon Gate guys were in the ring, um, it was really, really awesome stuff. Plus, you know, my plan was kind of to build up Jack Evans and Teddy Hart and have them eventually uh, feud. And so things that we had done with, with Jack Evans, um, from his promos to the dance battle that he did with Human Tornado, um, the, the matches that he had, those were kind of amongst some of, some of the best stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Well, folks, we are not done here. You have to click the link in the description or the button right here at the bottom of the video to get part two of my interview with Kevin Kleinrock. We'll be talking about the most controversial moment in the show's history, whether or not it really contributed to the show's downfall, and 10 years after the fact, what Kevin considers Wrestling Society X's biggest legacy. Be sure to stay tuned for that. I'm Brian Zane, and we'll see you at part two.